Apple is finally starting the transition to their own custom silicon, and they're doing it with the new M1 chip that's going into each of the three brand new Macs, the MacBook Air, the MacBook Pro, and the Mac Mini. Ever since Apple's event, there's been tons of confusion over how this chip is gonna perform, how it works, and why Apple made some odd choices, like only having two Thunderbolt ports on the Mac Mini, and only having a maximum of 16 gigs of RAM on the MacBook Pro. There's also the whole thing about how the only thing different between the Air and the Pro is quite literally one cooling fan, but I think a lot of you guys are missing the point. So before I get into answering weird questions and doubts about these new Macs, as well as analyzing the leaked benchmarks of the M1's insane performance, I'm gonna do my best to explain how the new M1 chip is gonna work. For years now, Apple has been designing their own custom chips based on the ARM architecture that they license from ARM Holdings. They then send that design to TSMC, the most advanced chip manufacturer in the world, which builds the chips like the A14 Bionic in the new iPhone 12s, which is built on the same brand new five nanometer process that the new M1 chip is also being built on. To make it even better, Apple specifically designs their software like iOS and iPadOS to take advantage of the chips, just like Apple is doing with the new macOS Big Sur software for the Mac, which is made to take advantage of the new M1 chip. Because of all this, Apple has stayed ahead of the entire smartphone and tablet industry with their iPhones and iPads, making the most powerful and efficient chips ever. And now they're trying to do the same thing with the new M family of chips for their Macs, starting with the M1. This new chip is essentially a beefed up iPad chip thrown into a Mac but they're obviously adding extra features needed to run the Mac operating system, like the I.O. chip and Thunderbolt controller. Because of this, Apple Silicon Macs can run any iPhone or iPad app from day one, since the architecture is quite literally the same. This is a huge advantage for developers because in the past, they'd have to make two separate apps if they wanted to support both the iPhone and the Mac. But now, they simply make one app one time and it automatically works on both. The only downside is that developers can opt out of supporting Apple Silicon Macs if they choose to, so iPhone apps like Amazon Prime Video won't work because Amazon would rather have you use the browser where they can potentially track your data more easily and make more ad revenue off of you. And that's also another benefit for using the M1 chip you get much better security with the built-in secure enclave and the new architecture, which is way less prone to security issues compared to Intel chips, which constantly have security flaws like Meltdown and Spectre. Now the downside of the new ARM-based architecture is that third-party apps need to be updated to support it if they want to run natively. But don't worry, every single third-party app that you had before on your Mac is still gonna work fine because Apple created Rosetta 2, which I'm gonna talk about later. Now the other downside to this is that you won't be able to run the traditional x86 version of Windows via bootcamp anymore. So no more loading into Windows to play games and no more using eGPUs to boost graphics performance either. Apple Silicon Macs are gonna rely on playing games that were already available on the Mac, like Shadow of the Tomb Raider, and of course, ARM-based games from the iPhone and the iPad, which I believe are gonna start becoming much more impressive in the next couple of years. Now with all of that software stuff out of the way, I wanna jump into the actual M1 chip itself and how it performs. On previous MacBooks, everything from the CPU, the GPU, the memory, the T2 chip, the I.O. chip, and the Thunderbolt controller were on different areas of the logic board, so data had to travel back and forth between all of those components, which introduced latency. Now with the new M1 chip Max, all of that is being built into one single chip, or SOC, and every component is connected using high bandwidth fabric, which also connects to a unified pool of memory that's accessible to every component on the fly, without having to copy it between different pools of memory like traditional systems have to do. So here's a weird analogy to help you understand how the unified memory works. 
Imagine you have a painting that both the CPU and the GPU are working on. Instead of them each taking turns and handing the canvas back and forth between each other, they're both side by side painting on the canvas at the same time, and that's how unified memory works. This greatly lowers latency, increases efficiency, and improves performance. And if you're worried about the GPU using the same memory as the CPU, don't worry because the CPU has its own dedicated cache, and the GPU actually has its own dedicated tile memory as well. Making it even better, the 8-core CPU is split into four performance cores and four efficiency cores, with a performance controller which works in real time to enable and disable cores for maximum performance and efficiency. This means that when you're surfing the web or using a basic app, you're most likely only using the efficiency cores, drastically saving battery life to an Intel chip which has to use the same cores for everything. Going even further, standby battery life on the new MacBooks is incredible because it could only be using one of those efficiency cores while it just sits there. And this enables the always on feature, just like you have on a smartphone or a tablet. Compared to a lot of Windows laptops, which go into a deeper sleep to save battery life so they could take seconds to start back up. But the advantages don't stop there. The M1 chip also packs the 16-core neural engine and two dedicated machine learning accelerators, which will be a game changer for those who do that type of work. There's also the new image signal processor, which will help make the 720p webcam look better, with better exposure, less noise, and more accurate white balance. There's also dedicated video encoders and decoders, which will greatly help for video editing and it's gonna enable low power video playback, which is basically what allows the MacBook Pro to get up to 20 hours of battery life. And to make it even more interesting, the M1 chip supports the latest Gen 4 PCI Express, which basically confirms that the future Mac Pro is gonna have support for that as well. Now with all of that out of the way, let's move on to the M1 chip's leaked benchmarks, which are absolutely mind-blowing. Let's start off with that single core score of 1717, which is basically higher than any Mac ever recorded, with the new 27-inch iMac in second place with a score of 1251. That makes the new M1 chip 37% faster in terms of single core performance than the previous best Mac, which is incredible. Just to put that into perspective, the absolute best single core score on any Intel processor is 1410 on the latest desktop i9-10900K, which you can buy for around 500 to 600 bucks on Newegg, and that's just for the processor itself. And to make it even crazier, the new M1 is trading blows with the brand new 5950X top of the line CPU from AMD. Now moving on to multi-core performance, the new M1 chip scored 7,423 points, which basically makes it 9% more powerful than the 16-inch MacBook Pro with the best i9 processor, which is priced at $2,700. And it outperforms every 6-core 2020 iMac 27-inch as well, which are priced at up to $2,000. Now obviously that's just a short benchmark, but due to the new efficient process, it could very well outperform those Macs in performance tasks. But the most important thing to understand is that this new M1 chip is the slowest Apple Silicon Mac chip that Apple will ever make. We're still expecting a fully redesigned 14-inch MacBook Pro and a 16-inch MacBook Pro coming next year, maybe before the end of summer. And we're also expecting a new redesigned 24-inch iMac as well. Many months ago, it was leaked that Apple was working on a new 12-core Apple Silicon Mac chip. So I believe that that 12-core chip is what's gonna be going into all three of those Macs and it's probably gonna be called the M1X or the M1Z. In that chip, Apple will most likely keep the same four efficiency cores, but double the performance cores to eight cores. And based on my own estimations, it should score around 11,000 to 12,500 points in Geekbench 5's multi-core test. 
potentially outperforming the current 12 core Mac Pro that we currently have in our office. Now moving on to graphics performance, there was a leaked benchmark running OpenCL, which these chips are not optimized for since they're optimized for metal, and that scored 18,500 points. I personally think that the 8-core version of the M1 will break 20,000 points in terms of the metal score in Geekbench 5, making it twice as fast as the previous best integrated G7 graphics in the 10 Gen Intel chips, and around 33% faster than Intel's latest XE graphics. But compared to the 16-inch MacBook Pro, which has a dedicated graphics chip, the new M1 still falls short, with the base 5300M getting around 25,000 points in metal, compared to the M1's estimated 20,000. But keep in mind that the new 12-core M1X chip is gonna have faster graphics as well, potentially a 12-core GPU, which could bring the score up to as high as 30,000 points in metal. And it doesn't stop there. A couple of months back, we had leaks of a new iMac launching in the second half of 2021 with a custom Apple dedicated GPU, which is gonna be incredibly powerful just based on how impressive the integrated graphics on the M1 are. And keep in mind, that both of those GPUs are gonna be working together on that iMac. Now with all of that out of the way, let's finally get into answering a couple of the questions and doubts about the new M1 chip. Why in the world are the new MacBooks limited to just 16 gigs of RAM? Well, because they're replacing MacBooks, which only had a maximum of 16 gigs of RAM on the previous models. I'm 100% confident that on the 14 inch MacBook Pro next year, you're gonna be able to get 32 gigs of RAM, and you may even be able to get the same 64 gig of RAM limit on the 16 inch MacBook Pro, but we'll just have to wait and see. And a lot of you guys are doubting that 16 gigs of RAM is gonna be enough. But keep in mind that the M1 chip is using a new unified architecture, so it's gonna use RAM much more efficiently compared to Intel chips, especially when running native ARM-based apps using the new macOS Big Sur, which is fully optimized for these new chips. It's sort of the same story as the iPhone's RAM management, with the new iPhone 12 Pro with six gigs of RAM outperforming the less efficient Galaxy Note 20 Ultra with 12 gigabytes of RAM. So there's a good chance that 16 gigabytes of unified memory on the M1 will perform close to as well as 32 gigabytes of RAM running on an inefficient x86 system. Moving on, why do the new MacBooks only have two Thunderbolt ports instead of four? Well, because they're replacing models that only had two ports previously. Apple is saving the four ports for the more expensive 14-inch MacBook Pro and 16-inch next year, which will replace the models that currently have four ports. Yes, I agree that it sucks that the new Mac Mini only has two ports instead of four on the previous model. So it seems like the M1 chip has a limited number of CPU lanes, so they weren't able to pack four ports onto that model. That's also probably the reason why these new Macs can only connect to one external display. There's probably limited Thunderbolt bandwidth, but keep in mind that there is a very small percentage of the market that needs to connect to more than one external display while using a lower end MacBook instead of just getting something like the 16 inch MacBook Pro. Moving on, why does the base MacBook Air have a weaker version of the M1 chip with only a seven core GPU? Well, the main reason is something called binning. Since this is a new chip, sometimes one of the GPU cores won't pass quality control. So instead of tossing the chip out, they can disable that one core and throw it into the less expensive base MacBook Air, which isn't really meant for high graphics performance workflows. Now that brings us to the next question. Why does the MacBook Air not have a fan? Well, because it makes for an incredible silent experience having no fan noise at all. And for basic and common apps, there shouldn't be any overheating issues. But the even more important thing is that a couple of years later, the fan and the heatsink won't get clogged up with dust, which will make it start overheating like on basically any other laptop or PC. 
the MacBook Air won't have this issue at all since it doesn't have a fan, which gives it incredible long-term reliability. Now, the last concern is software support, with people worried about apps like Microsoft Office running on the new Macs. And for that, the answer is Rosetta 2 emulation. Basically, every single app you're currently using on your Mac is gonna work instantly on the new M1 Max. And from what developers have said in the past, Rosetta 2 is able to run those apps under emulation faster than current Intel chips can run them natively. Now, as for the performance apps like Photoshop and Premiere Pro, we're not exactly sure how well Rosetta 2 is gonna run them, but they will eventually be updated to run natively, hopefully sooner than later. And by the way, if you're worried about plugins in apps like Logic Pro, Rosetta 2 will also be emulating them on the fly until they get updated, but we're still not sure how they're gonna perform. And here's the final question. Is Apple gonna close the ecosystem down and only allow apps to be downloaded from the Mac App Store? Of course not. Here's the answer from Apple themselves. Macs will stay Macs the way you know and love them. They will run the same powerful pro apps. They will offer the same developer APIs Macs have today. They will let users create multiple volumes on disk with different operating system versions, and they will let users boot from external drives. They will support drivers for peripherals, and they will be amazing Unix machines for developers and the scientific community that can run any software they like. So there you guys go. Hopefully this video helped answer some of your questions about Apple's new M1 chip. And if it did, go ahead and click the circle about to subscribe because we got four of these new Macs on order and we'll be testing all of them in depth. And if you're struggling to decide if you wanna upgrade, check out those two videos right over there.